this picture in the middle, this black and white image, is one of the images taken from the OSTF's Robust tour. And it's actually quite a nice photo. It um, is a pretty good photo, actually, because it captures a light-hearted personal moment, you know, between a group of people. Everyone is naturally smiling. And uh, this one's done in Melbourne. And the thing being with Mark McMurtry, even though he may have been born in New South Wales, his um, family connections are in Victoria as well. He's got um, some of his first uh, dealings start in Victoria. He started off in Victoria before he went to New South Wales, put it that way. So I suppose what makes a good photo is that actually in that photograph there is honest emotion actually being expressed. There's joy, everyone's laughing, and it's natural, it's not rehearsed. Even though so much of the tour that they're going to go on from when they got to Melbourne, they'd only just virtually started their tour. And they were yet to head into central deserts to the real tribal Aboriginals. They'd only been dealing with uh, coastal tribal tribes up until that point and to a large degree they are looking towards this one in the middle here Gary Jacamara because he's carrying the Walpuri skin name they're thinking well he's from Walpuri uh, they're more connected so we're going to listen as I've said these things are used as a sales ploy not as a truth because um, you know, there are people far and wide throughout all of Australia that it's not only Gary Giacomara that they have no clue. He's, no one in the Walpuri know he's Walpuri. None of his neighbours who know the Walpuri don't even know him. Who is he? You know, and when your own tribe asks, who are you? You've got a big problem. But the whole purpose for bringing this up was that, okay, so over the Christmas New Year break, there's a lot of departments that have closed down. But before they actually did, a lot of what has been going on behind the scenes with Nightcap on Mingeable has come to a lot of fruition in that they've, there's been steps forward and there's been progress and so whilst all of it's been gathered together, um, I'm bringing out now more of the tribal issues that I haven't brought up and discussed in the past when I've been mainly focusing on bringing out all the information that I possibly could. Now, there is still more updates that I could give you on what's going on at NICAP. Um, but at the moment, things are moving forward. Uh, they didn't have a very good Christmas there. Their best laid plans are mice and men. You know, you can't plan for the unexpected. And the thing is that that's what's happened for them, the unexpected. They had expectations that are now not going to be fulfilled. And they have a fresh batch of promises that they made to investors based on things that they can't fulfill now. See, there were a lot of Nightcap on Minjimble members that were on the list of the liquidation to actually get paid money, big, big amounts of money. And this was all the allegation of stacking the creditors because all these invalid debts were on there to bring the money back because all the investors that paid for all these things, the past lost investors, none of them authorised any of this. So this is why the accusations have always been there. But as it seems, the liquidator, 
for Stephen Starts is not going to pay any of those creditors that are not trust creditors, which means that it doesn't matter whether the uh, accusation is correct or not because it's not an event that's going to happen. From what I've read and the PDF that I've provided and anyone else can also read, I'm pretty well understanding that none of those that the past lost investors said they are not creditors of the business. None of us authorised any of those transactions. None of those ones are going to get a look in because they are not trust creditors. They are creditors of Wollumbin Horizon as any business would be, but they are not creditors of the trust. And the trust is those that actually bought in. So it is irrelevant now what claims were made. So all those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that were that was anticipated would come back and funnel back into the community is now not going to happen. The only ones that are getting paid out are the trust creditors. And I should point out that of the trust creditors name there are ones on that list that have not suffered a loss. That's Cherie Stokes, Philip Dixon, Richard Mote and Christy Brennock through her husband Adrian Brennock receiving the share because he was a bankrupt and couldn't receive it. And also two people that are said to be living there. Uh, Dean Mooney and Philip Morandini. Now those people that I've just listed do have not suffered loss. The only reason that the past lost, lost investors can actually make a claim is because they have lost something. If you're living there and still retain your, uh, well, whatever you want to call it these days, a share, a title certificate, your trust deed, your lot, uh, whatever the name is that gives you entitlement into that membership of Nightcap on Minjimbo and all the profits that are supposed to, as advertised, come back through all the businesses and feed back through to the members. I mean, it's not like we're guessing here that this is how it's done. They actually state that's how it's done. They have member companies that earn profit, bring it back to the members and the community. And by their own declaration, it is set up, they pay no tax on it. So there's no guesswork in that. So as the professionals around those delving into the investigations in, well, quite a few different areas now, you know, I am really pleased with how much this has progressed by so many different people's efforts. You know, this is not something that any one person does. It's a group of people that are actually working together as real community. And the thing being too is that showing how community can be outside of your own little local area too. You know, we are just people talking to each other. And it doesn't matter that you're not actually in my neighbourhood, but yeah, I'm going to help you with what's in yours because, you know what, you're good people and you don't deserve what's been going on. And um, anyway, so that's the update sort of on NICAP. And I'm not going to be faking as much on that in the next so many videos because it has reached a lot of... Um, I'm getting together all the evidence now. I'm putting my ducks in a row, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, and tying everything together to present and put it forward. 
and it, it, it is starting to move. I'm actually quite happy with what I've been able to start to get together and simplify it because anyone that's been looking at this thing knows that, you know, what there are 50 different parts to it that you know of and each one of those 50 parts has got a story behind it and they all weave and connect and, you know, it's complicated. So it's not just a simple story and it takes a lot to start off at the foundation and put it all together. But anyway, back to the story. <laughs> a long way round the bush, eh? <laughs> now the only reason that Samuel McMurtry even gets a mention in is because he has been constantly used as a contact for the OSTF, this pouty-faced little boy. <laughs> and the one in the dressing gown here, as I pointed out in the previous video, is that, you know, <laughs> sorry, but if you're going to have a photograph taken, can you at least not wear your dressing gown, you slob? You know, I see people out in the supermarket wearing their dressing gown, and my daughter knows, you know, she says, Mum, don't say anything, because <laughs> I usually mutter something to her about it, because seriously... What is wrong with actually presenting yourself so you're not like a slob? You know, you expect respect out of people and yet you, you want to show up like you just got out of bed or just got dragged out of the gutter or worse. So you can kind of see that this is over here on the right is Samuel McMurtry's Facebook photo. The one I referred to where he's like, Yo, man. <laughs> it's a wonder he's got his cap on the right way because that's uncool, man. You should have had it turned round and done a real bugging thing, you know. Oh, yeah, you've got the thing that's not going. Yo, yeah, you're cool, man. And I'm not going to fuck with you because, oh, wow, you got it on. You got it happening. I won't fuck with you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to pause that. Oh. So I just, uh, I said in the previous video where how when I look at him, the first thing I saw was, yeah, I've got a video of this bogan that came and confronted me. Didn't work out well for her. <laughs> but I'm going to pause again. Yeah, so I'll try and be serious now. Um, so that's what you'd call a priv private joke because just his image projected that same image of remembrance in my head you know this bogan crackhead that came into my face and you know it was like all pouty face and tough and yeah and it's like yeah I wonder if you've got your front teeth made or they've all crumbled out from too much crack or ice or whatever or cocaine or heroin you know <laughs> because it's a dead giveaway in the young there's only several reasons why you're going to lose your front teeth at such a young age you've had a bad car accident and it's knocked your front teeth out well the chances are that they'd actually have replacement dentures given to them through the process of getting healed at the hospital. So, you know, if they've got no gummy, if they're gummy in the front mouth, and or they've had a bad upbringing and their teeth are really bad and they just all started to fall out. But um, the, the third and most common option is usually through heavy powdered drug use of some sort. And there are classic choices for that, as people know. You know, like, uh, I'm pretty sure that um, coke and ice rot people's teeth out so much quicker these days than what heroin and all of these other ones used to do. I don't know. I'm not up, <laughs> you know, to date. It's not like I keep company with people like this. So, yeah, maybe I can stay on track on subject. So I think we're, that if you look at the pictures, you can pretty well agree that this guy here is Samuel McMurtry, Mark McMurtry's son, the one that, even though 
it's a current link operating on OFTF's website, this little support button up here I'll show you in a sec, where it's got Samuel McMurtry mentioned as the contact to support, to donate, you know? It's like, yo, Sammy, when those people ring you up to donate, dude, hey, if, tell me, where do you stick the money, Sammy? Where's it going? Come on, give us a smile. Open up that mouth and show us, have you got any front teeth? Do you look like you look like what I saw from that bogan crackhead? Hey, I knew this bogan crackhead was a crackhead. And you just got the look, bro. Sorry, I don't mean to take the piss out of them, but you know what? They are so full of themselves and they are troublemakers. As it turned out, the day that this bogan came round with them, there was four of them. Ah, oh, yeah, long story. But the short story, uh, one of those four, a few days later, had their arm chopped off. Yeah, they were dipping into the wrong things, doing too many dodgy deals. <laughs> now he's armless. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry, but it's one of those things that, you know, these people, they are so nasty. But when you hear, like, karma catches up with them, I mean, these people, you know, they've got shady dealings with so many shady people and clearly, you know, um, you get your arm chopped off. This was in Bow Desert in Queensland. So anyone listening knows Bow Desert area or wants to check up with the locals, they can tell you about the story that happened, oh, when was it, about five years ago. Yeah, how the guy got his arm chopped off and why. So that was one of them that came around that day. Cheap and nasty. And even in a, a little bit more information on that, in dealing with these idiots because they, be, they get too violent. They are nasty people. You have to bring the cops in. And, yeah, no surprise, the cops know them well. <laughs> they actually did a raid on them. Oh, I think it was about three or four months later, too. They got a lot of drugs, illegal weapons and things like that, too. So, you know, when you've got someone that deals in something like white powder drugs and they lose all their teeth from it, you can get, pretty much be guaranteed that they've also got, yeah, probably guns. And from what I've heard about what goes on around um, <laughs> the nightcap area where uh, people hear gunshots going off, yelling, screaming, cops get called. You know, this is a common occurrence. The violence amongst these people is, well, it's not part of their sales pitch, is it? All right, so I think we've ascertained that Samuel McMurtry. Here it is where Samuel McMurtry, and even if you go on the way back machine, there is the constant, you know, to contact for giving support. Now, this is not on the contact page. On the contact page, you get to fill out one of those generic little boxes that might go into invisible land. They don't want you to contact them but they do want you to support them. But oddly enough, it's not a publicly available link. So you'd actually have to be given this link to actually, you know, like it would do the rounds of trusted and supported people like Max Egan would give out this link to people so that they could then follow that to donate and support the OSTF. And who are they contacting? Samuel McMurtry. Uh, Mark McMurtry's son. Dressing gown boy. You know? Yo! So, he's the boy that's taken all the money. What's he been doing with it? Well, I came across this little interesting thing back in June 2014. Now, it's three minutes long. I'm actually going to 
play it and it's going to be out of sync. You know, I'm sorry. That's just my computer and the programming. I've got an old computer. <laughs> I can't keep it in sync no matter what I do. And apologise now because you can see it obviously. It's annoying, I know, sorry. Uh, the reason I'm here is uh, uh, I appeared uh, as a Mackenzie friend on behalf of uh, an acquaintance of mine on a traffic matter. Um, I was asked by the magistrate who was hearing the matter, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Dakin, uh, as to why I was asked to be there. I simply explained uh, because of a, a basic comprehension I have of uh, legalese and some of the processes of the court. When he asked uh, basically to provide an example of that, I explained to the court that understand means to accept, admit, not to uh, merely comprehend. Uh, he was offended by that and um, asked that I leave the court. Upon leaving the court, he um, decided he was going to unlawfully have me held in contempt of court and uh, had the, the sheriff and the prosecutor uh, place me under arrest, which uh, to, to our belief is an unlawful order due to the fact that the uh, audio evidence from inside the court shows that I was not in fact in contempt of court or under arrest for that matter. Um, uh, since then, it was then um, heard before Magistrate Dakin again who tried to insist that he hear the matter. Uh, even though even police prosecution uh, turned around and stated that there was a conflict of interest for him to hear the matter. It was then set down in uh, Tweedhead's local court where I pleaded not guilty. They also upped the charge and aggravated the charge from assaulting uh, an officer of the law, not a police officer, not occasioning bodily harm, to assaulting a law officer, occasioning bodily harm, which was an indictable offence to which I elected to have a trial by jury. Uh, the matter was then sent to, to Ballina local court for committal. Um, that committal didn't take place. There was a further adjournment to, uh, to Lismore on, a, on another two occasions. It has been adjourned again here today after they unlawfully withdrew the charges. The court was seized of the, seized of the matter. Um, it was supposed to go to, to trial by jury and to have the hearing. Um, uh, the unlawful withdrawal of the charges took place, so now we're back here for a mention. Um, basically, the evidence suggests that uh, I was not in contempt of court, therefore the arrest was unlawful and therefore the uh, sheriff and the prosecutor and the other officers involved are actually guilty of assault on my, myself and my person. Um, uh, so here we are and we'll see if we can finally get a hearing date. It um, cost me well in excess of $10,000 so far just to have my barrister turn up merely to get a further adjournment and further adjournment and further adjournment. Um, they've, they've repeatedly uh, attempted to pervert the course of justice and, and abuse the judicial process in order to keep me in the magistrate's court so I can't have a fair hearing uh, by a, a trial of a jury of my peers. Um, they're, they're insisting on making a stay inside the magistrate's court so they can have one of their bum buddies uh, make sure that I get the justice they think I deserve. Here's hoping that uh, the justice system works according to justice. Okay, so that was Sam McMurtry. Uh, I don't know whether I actually mentioned that there is another option for actually losing your front teeth. <laughs> A right hook. Yeah, you know, like, could you imagine Mark McMurtry and Sam McMurtry, what they do in court if they went up to ordinary people and did that? And I actually just thought of while I was watching that it's like I could just imagine him trying to mouth off to some bikey or something like that and saying you know I'm sovereign and I don't recognize you and he's he's gone recognize this mate and bam right right hooked him in the the face and knocked his teeth out so yeah there are a few ways to lose your teeth other than just <laughs> bad drug history but um so I'm not going to get too much into what he said there he said that he spent over ten thousand dollars in lawyers fees to pretty much pursue the fact that one he he states that pretty much the way he starts it off and explains it is that when he first 
how it all first started, it wasn't even him that was going to court. He was going there as a witness, much like his daddy gets called in as a witness on sovereignty and law issues because of his understanding of the law. Well, his understanding of the law, the judge didn't want to take his bullshit, charged him with contempt of court. And he's outside here saying, oh, oh, oh. you know, I wasn't and, you know, I did not do this and I did not do that. And they think that just because they say it, that, you know, it's like, duh, so many people can actually say, yes, you did. You go in there not to actually defend the person or help the person in the case, but to actually frustrate the court like your daddy does with all your legal and jargon bullshit. You know, the name McMurtry, I reckon, is known by every judge in Australia and probably the UK. Oh, now that's something I've got to tell you about the UK. Now, there's been a, a little bit said about uh, Rodney Cullerton. People know what's, that he's in the UK and the OSTF are supposedly, and Mark McMurtry, helping and acting with um, Rod Cullerton and the Great Australia Party. Now, the questions I've noticed that people have been asking about this is what is going on with Rod Cullerton with the OSTF? Is the OSTF um, acting for, you know, because... Most people actually think that Rod Cullerton is in the UK and tied up with the OSTF because they're dealing with sovereignty issues that um, of the tribes that Mark is there representing the tribes and Rod Cullerton's helping him. That's actually not the case. What is the case is that Mark McMurtry, under his tribal name is doing what he's doing um, that he's done for so many people. He's done affidavits and shown up as the defence as kind of like their expert witness like Sammy over here because of his understanding of the law and his way to argue and frustrate and bullshit. So Rod Cullerton has actually got Mark McMurtry as the OSTF to represent that legal aspect for him in the UK court. Now what Rodney Cullerton is trying to achieve in the court has got nothing to do with helping out any of the tribes, okay? It's got everything to do with helping himself out. Now, if you go onto Wikipedia and you read the story of Rodney Cullerton, I haven't read it in full yet, so this is only um, what I can remember about what was going on. So, you know, you remember that back in the time that there was Pauline Hanson, she was doing really well in a One Nation party, and then everything started going south for her and found out that she'd been... Um, well, there were, were corrupt people inside the party itself and she took the fall for it and ended up going to jail. Well, Rodney Cullerton has got a criminal record. He's also a bankrupt. And because of that, he is disqualified from ever holding pol um, political office, being a senator. So they stripped him of his senatorhood <laughs> and now Wikipedia describe him as a senator in exile. It's quite a funny name they've given him. Because you know what? The OSTF are sort of like sovereigns in exile too. But anyway, so Rodney Cullerton has been disqualified from being involved as a senator, being involved in politics, being involved in any political party in any political aspect of representing that party. So he cannot represent the Great Australia Party. He cannot even be registered. They've, they've deregistered him for ever being a politician. He can't be one. 
So he's gone to the UK because he's gone all through the Australian courts and they've said, no, nah, it stands. We're not going to overturn the rules for you. So Rodney Culleton's gone to the UK and has grabbed Mark McMurtry and the OST have to represent him to try and get it overturned in the UK courts so that he can become a senator again and not a senator in exile. So that brief explanation, if I didn't confuse you, the short and the sweet of it is that Rodney Culleton is falsely representing any political party because he's been disqualified from it. And he has been, he's appealed it and exhausted every avenue in the Australian courts and it, the ruling stands. He now is going to the UK courts to try and get it overturned through some pie in the sky thing that Mark McMurtry thinks that he can argue because of his grasp on the law. Well, if he has the same level of success as Mark McMurtry and the OSTF in the courts, he's going to come back empty-handed. And he's still going to be a disqualified senator that cannot represent a political party or a political agenda. And this is the person that has just joined parties, joined up with the OSTF. They're in bed together. Not only is Mark McMurtry in bed with a, a bankrupt Adrian Brennock and nightcap on Mingenbull development, but he's in bed with bankrupt Rodney Culleton, who is also a disqualified senator, forbidden from those activities and is actually breaking the law in promoting himself as a senator. That, uh, that's actually impersonating a public official. That's, that's a whole different kettle of charges when you're impersonating. Yeah. Like, and you have to, would have to imagine that his refusal to actually accept that he is disqualified and he goes, no, 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 I'm not disqualified. I'm going to continue to pretend I am still a senator because it's going to get overturned. I'm right, you're wrong. Mark McMurtry knows what he's talking about. You've, you're all full of shit. You can't have rules and laws. You know, I know everybody else in society has to follow rules and that, and, but I don't. I make them up, and I say they're this way. And they, they've got this mentality where they live inside this illusion. And it is an illusion. And... Uh, it's borderline mental disorder. Real, well, it's not borderline. It is the failure to grasp that no matter who you are, no matter which society you live in, no matter how fair the rules are, there are always going to be rules that you are expected to follow. You cannot stand up and go, I'm going to only obey the rules I want to and forget the rest because you know bugger it I don't have to live with other people I can block myself off and become sovereign and live on my own little land well as I'm saying these are all symptoms of some kind of psychosis these people that are so delusional that will keep butting their head against the wall telling people, no, 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 it's going to work, it will work. Because if they keep doing it, it will work. Well, you know what the, the definition of uh, insanity is? To repeat things that keep failing over and over and over again. To repeat doing the same things that you know will not succeed is the definition of insanity. And these people, by that definition, are insane. They keep doing the same things over and over and over, thinking that any time is going to be the time it works. They just haven't got it. It's never going to work. Because you can stand there and say, well, I've got this opinion and I think that, but guess what? 
You are one person in billions. And ultimately, when it comes down to it, you do have to follow certain rules laid down by society. You don't get to be all arrogant and go, well, I'll pick and choose which ones I want to follow and I'll change the ones I don't like. No, you can be just like the rest of us. You're not above the law. You will abide by the laws that society lays down as general for all of us so that you don't have people that get hurt. And, like, seriously, real estate development, even when I was a kid, it was a well-known fact about northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland. These greedy developers, real estate agents and promoters, they, you know, the warnings have been out there for decades. And, you know, despite even now you could look at current affairs and they're still going to be doing stories on here's another one that's popped up. It's like, seriously, how can people actually get sucked in these days? Because it's not like you don't have the opportunity to check all these things out before you make stupid decisions you're going to regret. And ultimately it is because you make a decision without checking all the facts out. And that usually comes down to good salesmen. That usually comes down to people that are telling you a story. It's not facts. And they will always say, well, it's not my problem if you didn't check it out for yourself. And that's a common thing they all say. Well, if you didn't check it out for yourself, you can't blame me, you know. That's only my opinion and you didn't have to follow it. Even though they make out that they know everything and you should follow it because they're the only ones that have got everything right and thereby you need to get your head around the fact that you need to wake up. That if you're against them, you're part of the system. You're the man. You're an agent for the government. You're supporting the crown. No, these are all arguments that these OSTF ones use all the time. You know what we are? We are just ordinary people that know a dick when we see a dick. <laughs> and we call out people that are full of shit. And I see OSTF getting called out all the time. They don't answer questions. Simple questions about, well, they're promoting this. And yet if you ask questions about what they're promoting, it's like, shut up. Don't ask. Why? What are you hiding? What's really going on? And tell me Samuel McMurtry, with all the support that OSTF does get, that you are the main contact for, do you, do you spend some of that money over here, those $10,000 that you booked up? Where did that come from? Did Daddy pay for that? Did you see Daddy at the beginning of the video? All dressed up in his suit, all proud. Oh, my little Sammy, he's going in to, to court. Oh, just like a chip off the old block. I'm so proud of you, Sammy. Well, I tell you what, Sammy. If you was my kid, I'd be telling you what an idiot you are because, one, you started this problem. It wasn't even your problem. You just wanted to be a smart ass and show yourself up in court that I know what I'm talking about. And you got kicked out of court and you couldn't even take that, so you were more of a smart ass. And so they got you for contempt of court. And then you started fighting it. You know what? Ah, oh, yeah, I'd tell my kids, oh, you know what? You deserve what they, they do to you if you're going to be so bloody stupid. <laughs> you know, you deserve what happens to you. You can't go in and be a dick. I don't care whether it's in court, to people in business, to people down the street, to friends you know. You just don't go walking around being a dick, button in that essentially was only showing up as a witness. And he created all this. Well, he got the attention, didn't he? <laughs> Over something really stupid he spent over ten thousand dollars and all the time well it wouldn't have been ten thousand dollars of anybody's money uh other than well it wouldn't have been his money i mean 
would have been funded, Sammy would have made sure that, well, your first contact for support is Samuel McMurtry. He controls where the money goes. So that could actually answer a little bit of the question about um, the money that OSTF get donated. Samuel McMurtry is in charge of it, the first contact. And if you go on the way back machine, oh, actually, you don't even need to go on the way back machine. It's on this one too. Rose Marie McMurtry. You know the one that Samuel McMurtry in his comments left me and said that I don't know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about, Sammy boy. Yeah, I do know what I'm talking about. And as he hoited toitily said, you know, do your research. It's like, yeah, well, you see, I wasn't even interested in him until he started it. And then it was like, yeah, I remember seeing your name and that Rose Marie. I wonder if that's your mum. Hey, yeah, small world, isn't it? Now, I could bring up a few pictures here of, you know, all the pictures that Mark McMurtry likes to post of all these expensive looking hot rod cars you know or sports cars or something he likes driving his flashy cars he's got several of them at least people know this and so where does the money for things like that go well you know for the last three odd years um he's been living at 3222 Cargo road and he hasn't paid a single cent in rent uh, even though people have said he should be paying rent and the court said well you should pay rent and they said oh yeah but you know your honour I am the caretaker I am there to make sure that the property is looked after <laughs> hey every renter should actually do that with their landlord they should turn around and say I shouldn't have to pay rent because I'm actually staying there to make sure that no damage comes to the place. I'm doing you the favour. So, you know, I could charge you for the privilege, but instead, you know, I don't. So don't ask me for any money for my caretaking responsibilities. Uh, well, I mean, don't ask me for any money for my rent, or I will have to charge you for my caretaking responsibilities. Yeah, I wish we could all use that argument, don't you? That let's not pay rent because we're caretakers. <laughs> you know how well that's going to work, don't you? It's going to work as well as anything else that the OSTF does because of their warped way of looking at things. So anyway, yes, we've um, got a, a pretty big McMurtry family affair with Samuel Rosemarie, who money order, send money order to Rosemarie at that P.O. box. Do people send money orders still to that post office box? I mean, money orders, you know, they used to be a fairly common thing, but these days that's like snail mail who uses it. <laughs> So where are the funds that OSTF get? Where is the support that they get from other people? Where is that going? Is it going to get Samuel McMurtry's teeth knocked out, missing, whatever, through however means? <laughs> and to pay for expensive lawyers so that he can follow in daddy's footsteps? Or, and, and or, all of them and more. I mean, if you think about it, in the last well, at least eight years that the OSTF could have been donated to, and by any large donations they may have received from anonymous benefactors or whatever, they could have received millions and millions of dollars. And it's a good thing because they don't have to justify to anybody how much money that 
actually goes to, in donations and how much they spend it and what they spend it on. And if you dare ask any of those questions, well, you know you're going to get an earful of abuse and told it's none of your business. You know, transparency is not that you should know. <laughs> it means that you should trust that they know what they're talking about and don't be so mistrusting and foolish that all these people out there that say that the OSTF are doing this wrong and doing that wrong and putting them down and saying you shouldn't go near them, well, they're wrong. You shouldn't be listening to them. And I'm not going to defend myself because you shouldn't be listening to them. It's like, yeah, good distract from the question, isn't it? People keep asking the same questions and all you're going to do is say stop listening to, to other people's questions and gossip and complaints because we never answer any questions. We'll just do, a, as I said, the politician dance. And the thing being too is that if you would consider that the OSTF represents a set of beliefs, a religion. You cannot serve two masters. You, I mean, I don't even know how anyone that considers themselves tribal Australian can actually even listen to all that brainwashing, uh, indoctrination, cultural um, assimilation of blending in um, another set of beliefs into your pure cultural belief. I mean, seriously, how do you... Um, if you are tribal and you live your cultural ways, how do you meld and blend in having a Christian belief? How do you serve God and Christianity and, the, and be bound by the rules of that religion and still be true and honest to your own tribal beliefs. Because Christianity looks at those tribal beliefs as paganistic and worshipping false gods. So you, if you are a Christian and you're still true to your tribal and uh, have come up with some kind of bastardized blend of something, from the Christian point of view, you are worshipping the devil from worshipping false idols in holding your traditional beliefs. You cannot believe in your traditional beliefs and their story as well. And you can't change the story. It's that's why they're religions. You have to be bound by that set of beliefs and rules to begin with. So what are they doing, this cult, this religion, that is coming into the tribes, bringing in other culture that isn't yours? Why, why don't you just simply reject it in the first place? It is an attempt to take over your culture and to make you into something that the OSTF wants you to be. And they're claiming it is because of all the input from all the tribes, but we can actually find no proof that there are any tribes. And anyone that has had some association with the OSTF, well, they're starting to complain that why does Mark McMurtry still have all control and why don't we have an equal voice? And on a final note, if he's got over 200 tribes, when he does have a meeting of those 200 tribes to decide, you know, what the next step is that they've all signed up under, that would be a major event. You'd need to book out a resort and have a, an event. And 200 tribes, that's going to be hundreds of people show up. Because you're not going to get just one person that shows up with the tribe. You're going to sh perhaps have two or three that would represent different aspects 
but even though all the same perspective, but the ability to to communicate on all different levels with other tribes so that they can all come to some agreeance and same page stuff. You don't see that happen. I mean, it, the last meeting that they had in Alice Springs was done without respect to the traditional owners and you see photographs of it and maybe videos that you might be able to find but what how many people showed up 20 who showed up at this meeting who was having a say well you can't ask the OSTF that they don't tell you that because that's none of your business who has the say and what goes on <laughs> anyway there's a lot of things to be brought out about the OSTF and Mark McMurtry and his involvement. And it seems like he's groomed his son over the years to follow in his footsteps. So when you look at the problem that the OSTF has actually caused in the division, the real division in the tribes, it's these people. Now I'm telling you, does this guy look like a guy that can represent your interests. He's been a smart ass in court that I, I would seriously give my kid a biff round the ears and tell him what a dickhead and how stupid. You know, you were lucky that the court only did that to you. You know, you think you can be a smart ass and go in and disrespect people everywhere you go because oh, I've got attitude and I've got rights and I'm sovereign, I can do what I want. i tell you what. There's a million other people out there that are going to tell you they've got rights too. And your smart-ass dickheadness is infringing on their rights. Oh, but I'm a sovereign being. I come first. I'm king of my own castle. Well, I'll tell you what, you build your castles in the sand on false promises, illusions, on the foundations of, well... Seriously, is it actually that easy for Sammy to follow in his daddy's footsteps because he's, he's been drug-induced to do so, that he's so easily manipulable and pliable and brainwashed? I mean, seriously, living with his dad for all these years, you know, going on the bro bus tour with him and, yeah. And it looked like he was dragged along. You know, he, he shows up to photographs in dressing gowns. He doesn't want to be there. And even Mark McMurtry, yeah, hang on. Even Mark McMurtry, look at this. He's got a hole in his T-shirt. He's a slob. A lazy slob. That, you know, I see other people that think, oh, but that's just, I'm not proud about what I wear. I could guarantee you that none of these tribal people here would have holes in their clothes and if you have a closer look I'm sorry they look very neat clean well presented these two I mean look at Mark McMurtry you can't help but see that big hole in his t-shirt and it's been there for a long time he's just you know he don't care he don't care if he's a slob and the thing is that if presentation didn't count, why would he even bother dressing up for the court so he can go in there and be a smart mouth? Uh, he's come out as a slob. He's thinking, yeah, I'll just present myself as I'm not a proud man and they'll see that. And it's like, mate, I don't see that as, you know, someone that is not proud. I see that as someone that is lazy and a slob. I mean, I'm not proud of my appearance. I'm not vain at all. But I certainly do not like to present myself as a slob. I wouldn't go out without brushing my hair, cleaning my teeth and being clean and smelling nice and having clean, unholy clothes on. You know, I'm not going to go out threadbare. I'm not going to show people I am lazy and don't care. And that's what a slob does. They show, I don't care about myself. 
And I know that, you know, like there are certain people that you get to a certain age and it really doesn't matter whether they've got front teeth missing or not. Because, you know, what well, I can understand that they don't want to get dentures and, you know, they've probably got to a stage where it's a, a fairly soft diet anyway and they're not going to be chewing too much. So, yeah, why well, go through that? And, you know, my mum, she had all her teeth pulled out when she was 18 years of age. They used to do that back then. You know, oh, well, look, uh, you got one tooth wrong, so we'll just yank out the rest. And so I know what she went through and how she felt about them over the years. And so there's no way that I could not understand why people make that choice not to get them. Mum's was always, well, at 18 years of age, are you going to walk around with no teeth in your mouth? Oh, can you believe that? They used to pull all your teeth out. For one bad tooth, oh, you know, eventually you'll have to replace, uh, get dentures anyway, so we'll just rip them all out now. Yeah, well, Mum died at 63. She may not have had that eventually happen. You know, she might have still had a large percentage of all the teeth. But they, yeah. Oh, how dental has changed over the years. Yeah. So I don't know, nobody knows where the money is going that goes to the OSTF. We could make up lots of things and ask, you know, is it going on drugs? <laughs> I mean, did you lose that teeth from too many, you know, too many shots of, I don't know, <laughs> shots of ice or crack, I don't know. Or is that more like, you know, not a, a pipe or bong smoking it way of taking it, but, you know, an intravenous way of taking it? I mean, we could ask lots of different things like this. We could also ask where someone like Samuel McMurtry could get all that money to actually pay for the lawyers, you know, and for what might be a very expensive drug habit or what could be an expensive alcoholic alcohol habit because you know what anyone that's been to a pub and has been partying knows that you get someone like uh, Sammy McMurtry or even Mark McMurtry at the pub you get a few beers into them and they become a real smart ass cocky person with everybody else they're going to meet someone that's not going to appreciate that seriously when I was on the Gold Coast a few years back there was this one girl that she used to go around. She was so mouthy. And was, we were getting a lift back from the pub this night. And this guy just turned around. I've never seen such a reaction to this before. He pulled out a gun and he stuck it right to her mouth. And he said, if you don't shut up, I'm going to pull this. <laughs> and she shut up. i tell you what she did. And it's like, yeah, because for all these mouthy ones out there, and she was mouthy, just like this Sammy, thinking she knows everything, blah, blah, blah. There's always someone out there that is just going to turn around and say, I'm not interested in your shit. Shut the fuck up or I'll make it permanent. <laughs> So you could see Sammy getting himself into trouble at the pub too, just like his dad would get himself into trouble at the pub. And that's probably why the nightcap on Minjimble want to build their own pub so that they could control the rules in the OSTF style and that if you dare question the king and Prince Sammy, you'll get kicked out. <laughs> and they've got every right because they're the licensee and it's their pub and they own it yeah they're just providing more means where they can grandiose themselves they do have psychological mental health issues they really do grandiose is definitely out there up there i mean so is narcissism i mean seriously these people uh, yeah chauvinism too and uh, yeah I get called a man hater because that's what chauvinists actually call people man haters it's like well 
you couldn't possibly be right that you are actually being prejudiced yourself against women. No. I'm prejudiced against men. No. You know, I'm just, well, I'm not even prejudiced against anybody. I just don't like liars, cheats and thieves. And these people sort of tick all the boxes as far as that. They're pretending to be things that they're not. They're big noting themselves. And whose money are they spending to do it with? Is it going on really expensive cars and to, I don't know. Mark McMurtry is a member of a $36 million development. $36 million. He's involved in that. He's part of it. He's part of that share. And he clearly doesn't need support for the OSTF because he's already got all the support he needs with $36 million development that he is a member of. He's getting rich off that. So he, he could use all that money that he gets from the OSTF on actually, all right, well, while the court actions aren't, we're waiting for that to go on, these donations have come in. I remember someone out there in the community said that uh, this thing had broken down. You uh, might have a generator or something. Look, we can get you one now. We'll fly that in for you and we'll make sure it's the duck's nuts. We'll, we'll buy extra warranty on it too so that it will be covered for a longer period. So that that's one worry gone. And that's another criticism too, is that people have said for all the promises of the OSTF to help the tribes, when they ask for help, there is none there. Because the only help that they want to give is for Mark McMurtry to appear in court and talk his legal mumbo jumbo. That's what you pay to get assistance with. Not anything else. So if you want to support the tribes and help them with what they actually really need right there and then, because what Mark McMurtry has been promising has been for the last 10 years, you know, and that doesn't fix things that are broken. That doesn't provide food where there is none. It doesn't provide all the things in the communities that people are saying, these are needs right now that you could help with. Why don't you spend some of that money to help the tribes? You're claiming to respect us, and yet you do nothing to help us. And every question they ask, well, you've ended up with only a few people in the OSTF that are like in a cult mentality. There is no uh, friendliness, no negotiation. There is one very hard definite perspective and if you do not hold it they will shoot you down in flames and tell you to piss off and leave them alone oh yeah like David Cole is one of them that keeps pretending you know, oh, oh, pretending sorry well he does lots of it thing that makes me like Max Egan uses the um, peacocks people use um, as sales tools, you know, animals, children, anything that will draw people in and go, oh, isn't he nice? Well, David Cole uses children and he does everything for the babies. He always says for the babies, the babies, you know, I love, I love the babies. I want the babies and the children to be, because the babies... It's just like Max, how he talks to Billy and the goats, um, Billy, <laughs> Billy the peacock, <laughs> and uh, was it Flo and all the others, and people through the comments, oh, they love talking about Billy and all the other peacocks and the chickens. Yeah, it's a sales pitch. They talk about animals or kids, babies, because, oh, aren't they nice people? Even kids and animals love them. They must be good. Well, David Cole, again, has to find it necessary, like so many of them do, that say, oh, you know, Mark is a good guy and everybody's saying all this stuff is bullshit about him. 
and all these things. He's, I am fighting for our babies. <laughs> yeah, you could put that on record and just save a lot of repeats, couldn't you? Now he comes up with, what are fools doing it for can, can only be one of three things. You're a complete puppet and a sellout. You've been sent to distract us or you are mentally ill. Well, actually, David Cole, this goes to show how small your mind and the perception is that you can have because there are more options than just three things. You know, there, it can be more. It can't only be three things because there's a very important fourth one that you forgot. What if we're right? What if you are the one that's mentally ill? You are the one that's sent to distract us and you are the complete puppet and sell out for all those things you claim of others. Huh? Is it possible that one thing you haven't considered that all those others are right and you are wrong? Of course not. You can't when you're defending how right you are. You cannot even consider the possibility that you are wrong. Well, you always have to consider the possibility that you're wrong. Because you could be. In fact, unless you actually lived it and experienced it, you can always be wrong. And even then, when you experienced it from someone else's perspective and the way you look at it, they can see you was wrong where you see yourself as right. So... You know, it's all a matter of perspective. So, yes, there is always the option, always the option that you're wrong. But I would say that these three things that he's pointed out pretty well clearly describes what the OSTF are. Mentally ill, sent to distract us and divide the tribes and are complete puppets and sellouts. Now, if they can say that safely, so can I. You are complete puppets and sellouts, OSTF. You have been sent to distract us and divide the tribes. You are mentally ill. I could be wrong, but you know what? There's more people out there that agree with me than disagree with me. So I'd think we'd go for the fact that you probably do have mental health issues. We know you've got ego issues. You need to really deflate them a little bit and leave room in the room for other people. The world doesn't revolve around you, your sovereignty and your rights. You live in a world with other people and it's about time you considered the rights of other people the ones that you trample all over to get wherever you want to be kings in your own little, I don't know, bros not hoes club. And on that note, <laughs> I'm going to catch you later because, you know, this is long. I've really crapped on a lot, haven't I? <laughs> I'll catch you later. Bye.